story of how God was seeking a bride for his son. Each book is different from every other book. I'm trying to give you the keys for you to unlock it for yourself. As we study the history of God's people, Israel, we notice particularly how God stepped up the punishments for their sins. And each one seems to get a little worse than the previous one. He started uh, by simply sending people in from other surrounding nations to raid them, people like the Philistines. And so their first punishment was loss of property. But then, uh, uh, since they didn't take any notes of that, it became a little more serious. Drought and famine and shortage of food. When they still didn't listen to that, it became disease and loss of health. But the ultimate punishment for them was to lose the promised land and be taken away into another country again. They'd been brought out of Egypt, but ultimately if they went on as they were, and they did, God said, right, out of my land. And so there were, in fact, two exiles because by the time uh, the worst punishment came, there had been civil war and the ten tribes in the north had set up their own king and the two tribes in the south still kept Jerusalem and the royal line of David, but there was civil war between them. The two tribes in the south were called Judah after the largest of the two. There was little Benjamin joined in, but they were quite small, so they took the name of Judah and from that we get the word Jew. Now the first exile was in 721 BC when the ten tribes were taken off into Assyria. But then Assyria went into decline and was taken over by Babylon. And so when the second exile came of the two tribes in the south of Judah from Jerusalem, uh, in 586 it was Babylon that took them away. And that was the major exile of which the Old Testament speaks, Babylon. Now, funnily enough, when the Babylonians came, they did not do what Habakkuk expected them to do. They didn't completely wipe out everything. They were really actually much gentler than was expected. And in fact, they deported the people in three groups at three separate times. The first time, they took away the royal court. They took away all the rulers thinking that would be able to subdue the nation of Judah and keep them under Babylonian control. So they creamed off the top layer of society and in that top layer was Daniel. And he was taken away as a teenager with the royal court uh, to Babylon. And he figured very largely in the exile, as you know. Well, that didn't work and I'm afraid uh, those who were left still tried to get their freedom from Babylon. So they came a second time in 597 and they took away all the craftsmen, all the people who made the money uh, to try and impoverish the people and bring them under control. And among the craftsmen they took away was a priest called Ezekiel and he figures quite large in the exile as well. It still didn't work and still the remaining people rebelled against Babylon. So finally Babylon came in 586 and took the rest of the people away and raised the temple to the ground and destroyed everything. So Jerusalem was a ruin and deserted, Judea was empty, and the tribes of Judah and Benjamin were taken away to Babylon. So there were two exiles, one of the northern ten tribes, one in the southern two tribes, one to Assyria, one to Babylon. Though, of course, these were in much the same place on the Mesopotamian plain where the Tigris and the Euphrates flow. And there were these three deportations. So the people were all taken away, uh, ultimately, under the reign of the Babylonian emperor Nebuchadnezzar. They were there for 70 years. I'll tell you why in a moment. Uh, but it had to be exactly 70 years. And uh, Daniel, of course, uh, read in Jeremiah that it would be 70 years. And when the 70 years were nearly up, he got quite excited and began to pray, Lord, it's time to bring us back. There were three returns. And uh, that confuses people a bit. So there were three deportations and then three returns. The first was in 537, 
under a man called Zerubbabel, who was in fact of the royal line of David. So he brought the royal line back to uh, Jerusalem, and in fact he's one of the ancestors in Jesus' family tree in Matthew 1. So they got the royal line back, so the prince led the first lot back, and he led just about 50,000 people of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin back to the Promised Land. Just uh, over 90 years later, there was a second return, but not of very many, about 1,800, and uh, that was in 458 under Ezra, who was a priest. And he brought back the Levites because no Levites had come back. And of course, they needed Levites to restore the pattern of or structure of the people of Israel. So Ezra collected up as many Levites as he could. In fact, not many of them wanted to come. So he went out again and rounded up another 38. And he brought the Levites back. And his concern was to restore the religious life. Whereas Zerubbabel was to restore the social life, Ezra wanted to restore the religious life, and so he brought the Levites back, and with them sought to restore the religious structure of Israel. But uh, later still, uh, not much later, from 458 to 444, Nehemiah then came, and he only brought a few craftsmen with him, because their concern was to rebuild the physical side of the nation, to get the walls of Jerusalem built. So you have the rebuilding of the social life, the rebuilding of the religious life, and the rebuilding of the physical life, because they needed a fortified city to be safe in again, and the walls of Jerusalem were not built up until Nehemiah came. So you can see how um, gradually, it was quite gradually, it was, this was Exodus 2, but it was quite unlike Exodus 1. Uh, it seems to have been done in bits and pieces, and one thing strikes you immediately, that hardly anybody came back. I mean, out of the total number of Jews by now, that's a very small number, and that's very significant, because they had a much better time in Babylon than they'd had in Egypt. They weren't slaves, they got into business, and when the Jews get into business, it's not easy for them to go back heard a lovely story about a little Jewish businessman in New York and he, he bought a little shop, a tiny little shop that was squeezed in between two gigantic supermarkets or multi-stores and he wondered what to call his little shop so he called it Entrance. <laughs> and uh, the, the Jews are very good at business, they always have been. They have had to live by their wits, they are very shrewd. And I'm afraid in Babylon they became good businessmen. And when the time came to come home after 70 years, if you've been established in a business in 70 years, it's not easy to leave it and go back to a poverty-stricken little place where there's no business. And the result is that most Jews stayed in Babylon. And it was from those Jews who stayed there that the wise men followed the star to Bethlehem. They were looking for the star that was the sign Balaam the prophet had said, a star will arise out of Jacob. And it wasn't Gentiles, the wise men who came from the east, it was the Jews left behind in Babylon, the Hasidim, the wise men of Israel. So you see how it all fits together. The story is amazing, really. The more you understand it, the more you see. Well now, we are looking at two books of the Bible called Ezra and Nehemiah, named after the second and the third return though in fact the two books cover all three returns, and Zerubbabel figures in the books, Ezra figures in both books, and Nehemiah figures in one of them. So we're now going to look at these two books. And the first thing that strikes you is that they are so like each other. When you structure them and see how they're made up, you find out they follow exactly the same pattern, which begins to say something. Surely they must have been written by the same author. Who was it? Furthermore, the writing is so similar to the book of Chronicles. And in the Hebrew Scriptures, the two books of Ezra and Nehemiah were bound together in one book. And even later they were called First and Second Ezra. And they were also bound together with Chronicles. And the suggestion, which I think has a lot going for it, is that Ezra wrote the whole lot. Ezra was a careful man to keep records, 
and uh, it looks as if he wrote the book of Ezra and the book of Nehemiah and the book of Chronicles, which is quite different, quite different from the book of Kings, incidentally. But when you look at the two books, they are each in four sections. And the second and fourth sections are identical. Rebuilding and reforming. Rebuilding the state and reforming the people. And the three returns are then sandwiched in between. So in the book of Ezra you have the first return under Zerubbabel, a rebuilding of the temple in that case, and then the return under Ezra, then the reform of the people. That's one of the saddest features of both books, that when the people got back, they went back into sin. Isn't it tragic? It had cost them their land, they'd been away from home 70 years, and yet when they got back, they started ignoring the commandments of God. How quickly people forget. So we have the return, number one, under Zerubbabel, rebuilding of the temple, though that went in fits and jerks, and it took the prophets Haggai and Zechariah to get it going again. That's where they fit in. And then return number two, the reform of the people. Return number three, the rebuilding of the walls, renewing the covenant, and again, the reform of the people. Every time it seemed as if the people forgot about the sins that had lost them their land. It's even more remarkable than that, the structure of both. I don't know if you can see the little AB and ABC and ABC and AB. Well, literally, as we shall see, the first section in each book has two subsections. The second has three, the second has three, and the, th fourth has t the third has three, and the fourth has two. Similarly here, we'll find the first section in Nehemiah has two subsections. This has three, this has three, this has two again. It's a remarkable structure. It's been planned very carefully. It's beautifully composed and balanced. So surely it must have been from the same compiler. And I think it must have been Ezra. There's one other remarkable parallel. Chapter 9, in both cases, is an amazing prayer of confessing national sins. And uh, if you've been caught up at all in the national prayer movement, uh, of the last few years, you'll know that those two chapters have figured very large in that movement. In both cases, there is a public confession of national sins before God. So the two chapter nines are well worth reading in both the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. Well, so much for the similarity of the two books. So let's look now at the book of Ezra. You can see the four sections here, and now the two subsections, the three, the three, and the two. And uh, you may think I'm imposing that analysis on the books, but if you check in the books, you'll see that that's a very careful topical analysis that comes out of the book. It's a remarkable pattern, very beautifully composed and put together, uh, quite skillful actually. Both books are written in two different languages. And that's the first time we've encountered that in studying a book in the Old Testament. They're written in Hebrew and Aramaic. Now, Aramaic was a kind of Esperanto. It was a kind of common language that everybody could speak. Just as years later, Greek became a common language that everybody could speak at the time of the New Testament. But in the Old Testament, Aramaic was a common Semitic language that you could use anywhere in the Fertile Crescent in the Middle East and they had been exposed to Aramaic in their exile in Babylon, and of course for business they had to learn that. So many of the Jews spoke Aramaic. And many of the records they brought back from the exile were written in Aramaic. And some of those records of the family trees and so on in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah are still in Aramaic. So when it's translated in, into English, it has to be translated from two languages. There's only one other book in the Old Testament that is in two languages, that's the book of Daniel, for the same reason, that it was written in the exile. And these two books were written immediately after the exile. So they came back bilingual. They came back able to speak the business language of Aramaic and their own language of Hebrew. Now let's just run through quickly. It's, it's very straightforward. 
so I, I'm not going to make a commentary on every bit, but it begins with a man called Cyrus. He is now the Persian ruler and the Medes and the Persians have conquered Babylon. So Cyrus is now the big boy in the eastern end of the Fertile Crescent. He's the world power, but he's a very benevolent man. And the policy he followed was a policy of kindness. It's interesting that as far back as Isaiah, as far back as Isaiah, which is going back a long way, Isaiah knew the name Cyrus and says, God will send his anointed servant Cyrus to bring you back from exile. Now many scholars can't believe that Isaiah could possibly have known the name and therefore they say, oh, it was written up after the event, but God knew the name and God said he would raise up this man to bring them back. And this man had this enlightened policy towards all the people that uh, Babylon had brought away from their land. I'm going to let you go back to your land and I'm going to encourage you to rebuild your religion and I want you to pray to your God for me. Now he didn't just say this to Israel. From archaeological records we know that he said it to all the captive peoples in Babylon and he was hedging his bets, really. He was getting them all to pray to their God for him, so whichever was the right God, he was covered. And so among other nations, he said to Israel, now go back, rebuild your temple and pray to your God for me. And he'd said that to all the nations, but he said it to Israel. And you see God's hand in that, don't you? Because the 70 years are now up and God has raised up a benevolent ruler whose kind heart wants them to go home, get back into their religion. He didn't tell them to rebuild anything else. He said, rebuild your temple and then pray in it for me. So he had all the nations praying to all their gods for him. That's why I say he hedged his bets. It was a good insurance policy. Now Zerubbabel was the grandson of Jehoiakim and therefore the royal line of David and he was chosen to lead the people back so that he was encouraging them to have a king again. Actually, they never did. But at least Cyrus or Cyrus was encouraging that. And so Zerubbabel and company were told they could go up to Jerusalem. Well, they were on a flat plain and Jerusalem was up in the mountains. But that word go up, I've told you already, it's in Hebrew, aliyah. And they use that term to this day for people who leave other countries and emigrate to Israel they make aliyah and there have been many aliyahs in my lifetime. It really began in about 1875 when the first Jews went back from Europe to the Middle East and ever since there have been aliyahs going up to Jerusalem. In fact, in the Hebrew Old Testament, it's the very last word in the Old Testament because Chronicles is the last book in their scriptures. The last word in Chronicles is, let us go up, let us aliyah, let's go back. So Zerubbabel went back and they rebuilt. Now he took with him a high priest called Yeshua or Jesus. Isn't that interesting? Same word as Joshua, Yeshua, Yesu, it's Jesus. So he took the high priest and the first thing they did when they got back was to erect an altar and offer sacrifice. During the whole of their exile they hadn't been able to offer any sacrifice because they hadn't got a temple or an altar. The first thing they did when they got back was to put an altar up, offer a sacrifice. Do you know that's the first thing Abraham did whenever he pitched his tent? Again and again in Genesis, Abraham pitched his tent and erected an altar. The first thing Noah did when he got out of the ark, erected an altar. And now the first thing you do when they get back, they erect an altar. Now it was at that point that they got into trouble Artaxerxes had now replaced Cyrus and he received a letter from the Samaritans. Now the Samaritans were half Jewish and half Gentile. A few Jews had managed to escape deportation. They'd lived in the Judean hills in secret. They'd married other people left behind or other people from other nations and so they were hybrid, they were half-breed and the Samaritan was half Jew, half Gentile and for that reason was not very well liked by pure Jews. Apart from anything else, they'd escaped deportation. 
And from then on, the Jews and the Samaritans couldn't live alongside each other, which is why Jesus told the Jews about the Good Samaritan. And he was touching a very deep <coughs> division, which dated back to the return from exile. And the Samaritans didn't want the pure Jews back again from Babylon. They had now spread and taken the land. So they wrote to Artaxerxes a letter and successfully stopped the rebuilding. They made a big mistake because Artaxerxes was the stepson of Esther and therefore was very sympathetic to the Jewish people. Later, another letter was sent back from, Beri uh, from Babylon by um, uh, another emperor called Darius, Darius I, and he encouraged them to get on with the rebuilding again. In other words, the rebuilding was very patchy, very slow. They, there were times when the opposition from the Samaritans stopped the building. There were times when they just got tired of rebuilding and, and concentrated on rebuilding their own home. If you know Haggai the prophet, you know that he said, is this a time for you to live in panelled houses when the house of the Lord still is not built? And he, Haggai, had to get them going again. It was a real problem to keep their morale up because it was just a little group and in a barren land and doing a bit of rebuilding when they could. Don't get any sentimental ideas about how it went on, but uh, it was very patchy and started and stopped again and again. It was under Darius I that Daniel was thrown into the lion's den, you remember. So one after another of these Babylonian emperors, God made sympathetic. It's interesting, he touched their heart and made them sympathetic towards the Jews rebuilding against the local opposition of Samaritans. There's a gap of over 50 years now and then comes Ezra's return and Ezra was told he could go up 80 years after Zerubbabel had and he was given a magistrate's commission to enforce law and order because already there were problems in that regard. And Artaxerxes sent another letter at that point and encouraged the Levites to go and that's when Ezra managed to find number th another 38 who were willing. Then comes the reform. Boy, that's a sad part. You find, first of all, that Ezra prayed privately. <coughs> he interceded for the people. He said, God, please have mercy on them. Look what they're doing. They're going right back into their old ways. But that led to a public confession and he insisted on the sinners making a public confession before all the people of what they were doing. He made a blacklist. He was pretty thorough and he made inquiries. He made a blacklist of all the people who were drifting back into breaking the commandments. One of the most uh, common ways in which they were doing it was they were intermarrying. They were marrying outside the people of God. Now that's forbidden to Israel. It's also forbidden to Christians in the New Testament. And someone has rightly said, if you marry a child of the devil, you're going to have problems with your father-in-law. And that's a profound statement. Oh, how many people have hoped and thought that, you know, if they married an unbeliever, he'd get converted. It's usually a Christian girl marrying an unbelieving man. It doesn't work out. It leads to years of heartache. Marry in Christ. Don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. But they were doing this. Maybe they were short of wives themselves, I don't know. But Ezra insisted on breaking those marriages up. He said, if they're not in God's sight, that's it. And he broke them up. Now, the New Testament doesn't tell us to do that. But Ezra took that very seriously. And under the law of Moses, that had to be done. And wives and children were put away so that the people of God might be the people of God. He even went into pedigrees of some people who'd come from Babylon who weren't true Jews and he went into their family tree and he said, out, you're not, you're pretending to be part of the people of God and you're not. So that's roughly the contents of the book of Ezra. But what really grips you is the man, the man himself. Let me say a little about him. His name means help. Now it's interesting that Ezra's name means help and Nehemiah's means comfort. And if the one thing that was needed by this little group of returned exiles, it was help and comfort. And they got it. 
Now, Ezra is the Greek, is the Hebrew word for help, from which we get certain names like Eliadza, from which comes Lazarus, means help. And this man Ezra was a direct descendant of Aaron and of Aaron's son Eliadza, and later of Phinehas and Zadok the priest. So he had a really priestly heritage. And he brought the scripture with him, the law of Moses, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. And it says a beautiful thing about this man. This man was a scripture man. This man was a Bible man. And it says he did three things with the Bible. And notice the three and notice the order. It says he studied it, he lived it, and he taught it. Boy, that's a challenge. He studied it, he lived it, and he taught it. It's comparatively easy to do the first and the third but he realized it was very important to model it and to let his life as well as his lips speak. So he studied it, he lived it, and he taught it. Isn't that beautiful? There's a sermon for you, Kim, for your teachers. A godly man, a godly man with a strong trust in the Lord, a man of moral integrity, a man who could weep over other people's sins. Now, it's easy enough to weep over your own when you found out but to weep over other people's. That's a godly man. And his whole emphasis in, is in, in his teaching was the need to obey the Word of God, not just to be interested in it or to say, wasn't that fascinating, but the need to obey it. He kept saying that, obey it, obey it, obey it. Do it! Because the Word of God is not much use to you unless you do it. Tra tradition says he was the president of the council of 120 Jews who formed the Old Testament for us and collected the books together that we call the Old Testament. I don't know if that tradition is true, but the Jews believe that. Certainly he laid the foundation for the next 400 years because for the next 400 years there would be no prophets and the only word of God they would have would be the, the words of God in the past which are now Scripture. See, there are two ways in which God can speak to you, through his word from the past, scripture, through his word in the present prophecy. But where there is no prophecy, you've only got scripture. And Ezra laid the foundation of a Bible-based synagogue. And forever afterwards, the synagogue order of service follows Ezra's directions, even today. And the result is that every synagogue service is the exact opposite to the order of nearly every Christian service. It wasn't in the early church. The early church followed the synagogue order of worship. And I'm such an advocate of that that when I was pastor at Guildford, we followed the synagogue order of service every Sunday morning. And it's far, far better than the later Christian traditional order. And the order was Word first, worship second. That you listen to God before you speak to Him. That your worship is a response to what He says to you. And you know, that way worship becomes far more meaningful and far more varied. Because then sometimes you feel like dancing and singing and other times you're serious and in a penitent mood. <coughs> And instead of having to work people up to worship, I really cringe when I see a worship leader trying to get us into worship. You, know? you don't really worship until your mind is full of God. See, and, it, and when you come to church, your mind isn't full of God. Usually it takes 20 minutes to get going. You can save that 20 minutes by having the worship after the Word, because after the Word, people are full of God. And they're ready to worship, and usually we just announce one hymn and finish which is a tragedy. If you go to a synagogue, they spend an hour reading and expounding God's Word and then they respond to it in worship. That was the order of the early church and it was Ezra who laid that order. He gave primacy to the reading and explanation of God's Word. He set up a wooden pulpit in the marketplace and he read and explained the Scripture to them. Their worship came as a response. Much easier to respond to God after you've listened to Him. So uh, that's a bee in my bonnet, and I advocate, if you've read my books, you know that I advocate this, a return 
to the order of worship that Jesus was used to, that the early church had, because they got it from the synagogue, they got it from Ezra. Start with the Word. And we used at Guildford to have an hour in the Word and then half an hour's worship. And you save all that time, because after you're full of God's Word, you, you want to say something to Him. You're ready to worship. You don't have to work it up. Come on, everybody, it's not raining outside. Let's worship the Lord. I don't feel we're really into praise yet. Do you know the kind of thing? Uh, it becomes a human working up. But after you're full of God and you're thinking about Him and you've forgotten other things and you're full of Him, you're ready to worship. Well, commercial over, but um, there it is. This godly man laid the foundation and for the next 400 years, they didn't have prophets, they had scribes. And scribes were those who studied and expounded the Word of God. And as always, when there was no prophetic word, the scribes divided into conservatives and liberals. And you had conservative Bible scholars and liberal Bible scholars. Uh, the conservatives believed in uh, resurrection and the afterlife. They were called Pharisees and the liberals didn't believe in resurrection and the afterlife. And so they were sad, you see. <laughs> and that's how I remember them. <laughs> Far I see and sad, you see. Uh, but all the arguments about how to interpret the scripture came up and the Bible scholars and the theologians had a heyday. Interesting that when Jesus came, the common people heard him gladly because he spoke with authority and not like the scribes. You can tell when a man's got it all out of other people's books. And you can tell when he knows what he's talking about. I once dared to preach a series on the Holy Spirit, 20 sermons, before I'd been baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I got nearer and nearer to the book of Acts and got into more and more difficulties. And then God in his mercy baptized me in the Holy Spirit. The next Sunday morning I got up to preach again and I used the same notes and I thought I was the same preacher. But a young man came up to me afterwards. He said, uh, what's happened to you this week? I said, why? He said, you're different. I said, in what way? He said, well, this week you know what you're talking about. <laughs> and that young man who was a carpenter, he's now a pastor down in Bristol and recently had a television service uh, on Sunday morning. But uh, he said, you know what you're talking about this time. And of course, you can get it all out of books. And that's what they were doing in that 400-year gap. They were arguing between the conservative and liberal viewpoint. Then came Jesus. The common people had him gladly. You know what you're talking about. You speak as one having authority. But it was Ezra who laid that foundation of Bible study in the synagogue and giving it the primacy in morning worship. And that held them together during the 400 years that they never heard from God. They had the Bible. They studied it and they read it. They searched it. But I'm afraid they didn't just see what they should have seen in it. Jesus said, search the Scriptures. They're all about me. And he was talking about the Holy the Old Testament, and you need the Holy Spirit to do that. Well, we'll have a little break there, and then we'll talk about Nehemiah.